This is Matilene of Broadcasting Corporation. Inspired, inspired, inspired. Greetings, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Tulani Welcome on MPC, Matilene of Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, today we have a lecture from Mr. Vincent Zogu. Uh, we know uh, during the liberation struggle, uh, many forces were involved uh, to bring about what we call uh, independence. But if there is a section of the community that has been neglected or ignored totally. Uh, today, uh, Mr. Ndhovu will give us or enlighten us on the contributions and efforts that were sort of done by the masses. What did they do? What contribution did they bring to the table? Uh, did they really understand what was going on or they didn't understand? Uh, Mr. Jovis lecture will sort of unravel uh, the contributions of the masses uh, during and after the liberation struggle. Um, Mr. Njov, we welcome you on Material and Broadcasting Corporation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nkala. Okay, um, basically, this is going to be an opportunity to teach us, enlighten us on what uh, the masses did uh, during the liberation struggle, what was their contribution to the liberation struggle? Did they contribute anything to the liberation struggle? Or they were just uh, mere people doing nothing? So we will hear from you. And after that, we will ask, today I'm not going to ask you a lot of questions. I will really ask people to engage with you. Yeah, so this is your chance, uh, Babanzo. Over to you. Once again, thank you very much, Material um, and Broadcasting Corporation, for inviting me to share uh, with the audience what I have in terms of the contributions of uh, the masses uh, during the liberation war in Zimbabwe. Um, I've titled my a contribution, a case for the masses in a revolution that lost its way. A generation after the Union Jack was replaced by what became known as the Zimbabwe flag, there have been titles and designations that whenever they come up, raise contentious views among the citizens that are characterized by honor and praise on one hand and fear, resentment, and even confusion on the other depending on one's experiences and the understanding of history. Just because um, not a day passes without them being alternately mentioned on a variety of media, titles such as war veterans, heroes, freedom fighters, refugees, political detainees and prisoners have become so domineering in the daily Zimbabwe vocabulary that citizens are left with no choice but to memorize and internalize them though for various reasons or varying reasons. These titles or designations have been made the embodiment of the liberation narrative such that questioning anything about them has become associated with being unpatriotic. Such an attitude can only be right for a revolution that lost its way as a way to justify entitlement by a privileged few at the expense of the masses who find themselves being misrepresented, abused and denigrated by both their foes and those purporting to be their allies. Since the days of the liberation war, the masses who are generally referred to as the villagers or the povo are really recognized as a constituency that played a pivotal role in the fight against white colonialism. I have to qualify the nature of the colonialism because there has since been black colonialists depending on where one stands in the geopolitical dynamics of the country called Zimbabwe. The word povo, which is essentially a Portuguese word for the masses of the people, had to be so much bastardized and deliberately misapplied for the sole purpose of belittling these heroes of the struggle 
who so bravely fought the war without guns, such that they are rarely mentioned or only alluded to in passing, and that in most cases at convenient times when it suits the politicians, both ruling and in opposition. While on one hand, the armed fighters with whom they fought side by side undermined them as having a limited understanding of the struggle. On the other, the enemy also defined and treated them as mere terrorist collaborators. And as if that was not enough denigration, even the government that they brought into power still classifies them as war collaborators as evidenced by the recent questionable nationwide so-called vetting exercise whose purpose is to, as usual, replenish the dwindling ranks of gullible war veterans to be used to terrorize citizens towards the pending watershed general election in 2023. Generally known as villagers, a term that also characterized them to be of lesser social standing compared to other citizens. This category of citizens has been rendered so unimportant that the loss of their lives and livelihoods have become impersonal statistics of the liberation war to be thrown around as a way of seeking the sympathy of the same during election campaigns by both government and the opposition. At this point, an inquisitive mind should be asking the question, who exactly are these people? And why do they seem to be looked down upon by both sides of the war? Who define them as mere collaborators? A tag that has devalued their lives and th that they have carried to this day. Further interrogation would have the same inquisitive mind asking the question, but whose war was it? Why did they ever take part and for whose benefit? Notwithstanding the outcome of that pernicious and unforgettable period of history that has remained a nightmare in the lives of some, it is in trying to attend to these very pertinent questions that seem to have been pushed to the periphery in the liberation discourse that I will try to present today's lecture with the hope of putting things in perspective to bring to the surface the role of the masses, the peasants and the workers, if you like, in the liberation war that seems to have been buried together with the last best of the AK-47 against the FN rifle in a grave that the politician stands on to plead his or her case to be elected back into power to oppress, to oppress, to continue with the oppression of the remnants and offspring of these neglected heroes without whose participation there would be no Zimbabwe to talk about, even in its unenviable state. Yeah, we need to present them. There are that they are aimed at destabilizing Iran. But As a matter of fact, the politicians, both past and present, and the former armed fighters who seem to want to monopolize the liberation legacy, are biological as much as they are political products of the same villagers that the armed combatants had to depend upon to execute the war. Yet in spite of them being the, being, being the providers of the enabling logistical support to the guerrillas that caused them to be sitting targets for the enemy forces, the masses have been given a deal so raw that they have perennially found themselves at the receiving end of every political dispensation to this day. Because of my consistent interaction with the masses before, during, and after independence, I'm not apologetic about being biased in defense of their invaluable contribution to the struggle as the water in which the armed fighters had to swim. I feel that so far, the history of the Liberation War has shortchanged short them for their relentless effort and sacrifice. I'm talking here of people who provided all the logistical support to the Air Force that forced the enemy into negotiations that led to the ceasefire in December 1979. These are people who not as commonly believed only cooked for the freedom fighters. And I want to emphasize that. They didn't only cook for the freedom fighters, but also sourced the food supplies, the clothes, 
medicine, cigarettes, and all the basic daily needs. These are the people who provided information. Sucker in times of distress and moral support at great risk of being killed, imprisoned, restricted, and having their homes bent to ashes and their livestock confiscated and shot and killed to deprive them of the resources to support their families and by extension, the war effort. I'm talking here of people who so gallantly financed the war out of their poverty with the hope that liberty and freedom would one day compensate their toil. Even in times of poor harvest, that could have made even that could have been made even more severe by having food supplies cut off by the enemy on top of the general poverty. As the war intensified, these people had to feed more mouths in a situation in which various units of fighters could pass through an area one after the other and expect to be fed and clothed without failure. In many cases, the villagers had to go out of their way and deprive themselves and their families to make sure that their fighters were catered for. They understood their role so clearly that they even had the to organize themselves in such a manner that more often than not, they managed to outmaneuver the enemy all systems out in very hostile and dangerous circumstances. It was humbling to see the women crossing paths with enemy forces while balancing buckets and basins on their heads as if going to fetch water while they were going to feed their forces. The bravery, the confidence and the resilience was that of people who knew what they were doing. Hence, they did not deserve, and, and then and now, the insult of being labeled as collaborators, even by the so-called new dispensation that promised a different approach to the socio-political challenges that faced the country and its people. The political organization was such that the youths most of whom had stopped going to school because of the war, had to either voluntarily or with a bit of persuasion find themselves playing the role of being the eyes of both the villagers and the armed fighters against the enemy forces. Playing the role of being the shadow police and the intelligence services of the time, which they executed with so much zeal and resilience with the hope that for their freedom, the risks, the risks were worth taking. The youth had to draw the inspiration to play their part without failure from the adults who led by example in daily displaying the spirit of sacrifice. During the course of time, the youth's active participation would prove to the enemy beyond reasonable doubt that it was as much their war as it was for the armed fighters. As such determination and organization was not always the ideal situation in every part of the country. Allow me to talk from a Zipra point of view and to use Cholocho where I fought the war as a case study where the youth in conjunction with and under the guidance of the Zapu structures with an input by guerrillas on security matters, the people organized themselves into a well-oiled well war machinery that constituted a complete local authority with the armed fighters playing the role of the defense forces, such that by the ceasefire in 1979, we controlled the movement of vehicular traffic by allocating routes to business and passenger transport, such that it became enemy forces turn to, re to, to resort to guerrilla warfare in using the roads from point A to point B, which could not have happened without the cooperation of the locals. As such, according to the Parade magazine, by December 1979, when the ceasefire came into force, Cholocho was declared the most war-torn area in Matebelele. The war effort had been so much organized that most essential services, such as shops and buses, still provided uninterrupted services, except those that were closed by the enemy or, that, or those that we had to stop ourselves for security reasons but always in consultation with the local community or else it would not work. Of 
all this was because of the combined effort of the locals and the armed fighters with the youths doing the groundwork. By late 1979, one would hear conversations about the reopening of schools, which had to be basically hindered by the danger of making pupils targets for an enemy that had viewed schools as potential recruitment hubs for guerrilla training. In any case, these hushed conversations would only have become a reality with time when reinforcements were coming in to defend the semi-liberated areas if it were not of the ceasefire arrangements. I'm talking here of areas that had become inaccessible to the government of the day, its administrative capacity crippled and all economic activity stopped. It had become even more exciting and quite a positive development to see some locals who had run away from the war to urban settlements beginning to voluntarily trickle back to their homes to take an active part in this struggle. Great as it could have been, it would be naive to claim that everything worked smoothly all the way. It was only inevitable to have hitches here and there, such as the occasional excesses in the interactions between the armed fighters and the civilian partners, some of which could be very disturbing. By the end of the war, some of the local people had lost almost everything to their name, but they still remained resolute in that it was all for a just cause that would bring about a Zimbabwe with a place for everybody, which of course never was. It therefore goes without saying that the masses, especially those who remained behind when others went into exile, should never have been viewed and treated as though they had played a lesser role to that of the exiles, as is the perception to this day, such that exiles are consistently displayed have consistently displayed that sense of entitlement as if the revolution was a time-limited event that they won on behalf of everybody else. Again, citing Cholocho with a real-life context, to buttress my case for the masses in a revolution that lost its way. The liberation forces and the locals had such a working relationship that they were literally inseparable, with some having worked themselves to become irreplaceable assets to the struggle and deserve to have their names appearing somewhere in the chronicles of history. Some of them managed to survive the war only to become victims of the post-independence genocide in Matabeleland and the Midlands. They had become so important that even after 40 years, I can still compile a roll call of heroes of Cholocho from the top of my head, even during this lecture. But for such privileged information and for the sake of time, I refer listeners and viewers to my book, Seeking Freedom and Justice, Loyal But Not Docile, in which I tried to list a roll call of those forgotten and unsung heroes and heroines to, to represent their constituents. Let me end by categorically stating that as much as consultative and feedback meetings between the armed fighters and the locals were necessary, what appears in history textbooks as universal or standard guerrilla practice in the form of what has become popularly known as pungues or all night vigils was not part of the zebra mode of operation. Simply because though mass mobilization was part of the warfare there was no reason to endanger the lives of the unarmed masses by keeping them in one place as a group longer than necessary. There was also no reason why we would establish within our operational areas bases that, could not be, that we could not defend against the principles of guerrilla warfare. Overall, as much as the masses who were unarmed partners in the struggle cared for us, we in turn had to also care for them and made their security a priority. I thank you all for listening. And I'm of the opinion that this given, sorry, I'm of the opinion that this has given an insight into the undervalued role of the masses in the defeat of British colonialism. I thank you once again for your audience. Oh. 
thanks very much, uh, Babanjov. Uh, this, this, this is amazing. Uh, <clears throat> many people might not have known uh, the contributions of the masses in general uh, towards the liberation of uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, we really thank you for your lecture. Um, is it important for people to know uh, the contribution and the efforts abantu agate bebizwa ngokuthi o ababizwa ngokuthi iphovu is it important yes it is it is very very important because I am of the opinion that of the audience, of listeners and viewers, some of the people I'm talking about are their parents. Some of the people I'm talking about are their uncles. Some of the people I'm talking about are their brothers. And uh, above all, it should never, never have happened that there is this, this perception that is there today that is, it is only those people who are outside the country, whom I mentioned in the lecture as the exiles, who seem to want to monopolize the legacy of the liberation struggle. In the process, looking down on people who did all the dirty work, people, some of whom lost everything to the liberation war. Yes, it is very important for people to know what the masses did. Okay, no, thanks very much. Um, Nizonigas abantu to it to Valeli Loguti Uma Befunuguza Uma Kona Punti Beguza Babunjov. This is the time you can raise your hand, uh, then in the camp and engage uh, Mr. Jov. Uh, while these people are raising their hands. I'm painfully aware from your lecture that uh, these people that we are talking about, they were not armed. However, they were sort of in between, not, not just even uh, two armies, but made several armies because there was Zebra, uh, the Rhodesian forces and other forces. Uh, these people were expected to save all these different armies, maybe on equal terms. Then I asked myself, how did they manage to do it? Maybe if you can help us with that, Baba. This is exactly what I mentioned in my lecture, that the mm -hmm. the, 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 their determination, their resilience, and their sacrifice. They were so organized to the extent that they had outmaneuvered the enemy in any way, all systems out, because they knew what they wanted. Yeah. One, one force would come after the other, and they knew what to say in order for them to survive, although they didn't survive most of the times. Okay, no, thanks, thanks very much. Um, Leverson, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm pronouncing your name uh, correctly. Leverson yes. Ntongo, Ntongo. Yes. Uh, you can ask your question, please. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Katen for for the very insightful lecture. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, I think uh, the audience will bear with me uh, when I say it is very difficult to talk about such issues without being emotional and, 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 and being involved at that level. Because, you know, I think uh, what Tatendo has presented today just talks uh, about how the masses are being shortchanged in terms of uh, the credit that they deserve the credit and the acknowledgement that they deserve for not only having participated in the liberation struggle at the level that they did, 
but actually spearheading it. If, if, if you look at it uh, from a certain perspective, yes, we could say the struggle was driven top down by people who, who engineered it from a leadership position, but the momentum was created at the bottom. And that is why it became a success. I have one question and the question is, is not about the history of the liberation struggle, but it's about more on the future of, of our country. I, I want to ask Tatendovo to say, uh, what is the missing layer, Tatendovo, which causes the masses today to fail to be galvanized, to create the same spirit, the same commitment, perhaps to also generate the same level of self-sacrifice that is required to move the country forward. Is it that the masses of Zimbabwe have relaxed and sat back and said, we have arrived at our destination? Or is it that the masses perhaps at the moment are not mobilized actively enough to realize that we have reached a destination, but we still have somewhere else to go, which requires their participation. I, I don't want to be too long, but uh, that, that, that is my concern at the moment, because I think there is that missing layer. Thank you so much, moderator. Okay, thank you very much. Over to you, Mamanjo. Yes, um, the spirit of the liberation struggle faltered along the way because um, the masses were demoralized because their expectations were not, were not met. After their expectations were not met, they were divided. And that unity that was there during the course of the liberation struggle also faltered. And today, uh, the masses just, I guess they just float. They, 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 they don't have that uh, 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 resolution that they had during the liberation struggle. One, because of unfulfilled um, expectations. Secondly, um, the division, their division by tribal politics, which doesn't allow them to unite to see through what they are what their counterparts or their, 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 their children or their, 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 their parents or their relatives or their fighters died for. So people are demoralized. It's not that they are failing to unite. They are demoralized. They've been divided uh, deliberately. And that is, makes, them, makes it very difficult for them to, 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 to um, exert themselves. I mean, if you listen to the people across the board, you find that they, they see the challenges. They talk about them, but what remains is that they cannot come together because one, they are demoralized, and secondly, they've been divided. And uh, having said that, um, I, 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 for 10 years, was a, a, a community development worker, and, and, and I majored in civic education, uh, if you understand what civic education is. Uh, the main purpose of that education was to resuscitate that spirit. But in terms of people developing themselves, because some of these things just don't come, they need to be resuscitated, they need to be incentivized, they need to, 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 to um, they need people to be reminded of who they are and where they are coming from. But today people are just floating. So uh, uh, to summarize the whole thing, it's not that people are unable to uh, come together to solve their challenges, but it's because they are demoralized, they are divided, and they just decide to float along. So it's something that needs um, 
a, a sort of uh, a resuscitation of that spirit so that they can develop themselves, so that they can work together to develop themselves? I don't know whether I've answered the question. Um, Mr. Mtong. Yes. You can yes, thank you very much. Though. Yes. No, thank you. Thank you. I confirm that yes, I'm quite satisfied with the answer. I, I think then there's uh, hope, there's light at the end of the tunnel. I, I think uh, I know this lecture for us is about the, the historical plan. If people were to return to that spirit of working towards a common goal, because they got shared misery. Thank you. Okay, no, th th thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Mkanja, Derek Mkanja, do you have any comment, uh, question? Yeah, hello, yes, Salibona Nivantu, yeah. Uh, I think I would like to add to what uh, Liverson said, because um, I mean, I was never involved in, in the struggle at home, but I, I obviously witnessed it from a, a, a distance, because I, I, you know, I, I was overseas. Uh, during the struggle, but uh, looking at it from a distance, um, I've got this sense that um, while we're still sort of, I'll use the term never, ne never gazing for want of a better term, but while we're still sort of going over old ground and looking at, uh, uh, you know, talking about the war, Chimrenga, and there are, there's still this entitlement about how, you know, the people that contributed to the war, are the ones who hold the, the positions and and we're talking 40, 50 years after the struggle, and yet we're still, we still have this narrative and we're still talking in those terms. And I have this vision that, um, you know, until we get to a situation where we put the war behind us, regardless of whether we are sure now on Debele, and I do understand that there are issues with material and being ignored and the people suffering and so on, which is why I, Mr. Andrew knows I'm involved in my own projects to try and address that situation. But until we can get into a situation position where, uh, and I use the term the digital generation, you know, the people that have been born and grown up with the digital in the digital age, and all they think about is technology and how can we use technology to improve, improve people's lives. And then I, I fear that we're not really going to move on, you know. And, and, and whilst it's interesting to, to, to understand that the people contributed, and almost intuitively we know they did because because otherwise the war would the, 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 the war would, would not have been, we could not, would not have executed the war. Certainly the guerrillas would, would not have survived without the local people helping them. Uh, I, 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 would, I feel that we really should be moving the narrative onto you know what can we get our young people to do in this digital age to, 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 to sort of move forward because I firmly believe that uh, you know, digital technology, digital technology has now created a level, level playing field where people can actually um, circumvent some of the systematic problems that, that have led to a, a lot of people being disenfranchised and, and so on and so on. So that is where I, that, that is sort of the comment I would make that, you know, as Liverson said, you know, what, what, what do we need to rekindle that spirit, that spirit of of you know togetherness and resolution, but but apply that energy uh, to, to 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 something different in terms of how can we improve ourselves. That's the sort of comment I would make. Yeah, uh, Mr. Mkanja, uh, I do hear what you are saying, but I'm I'm, I'm just thinking. Mm. Um, don't you think that um, if we ignore? Mm to reflect on what happened in the past. We face a risk of facing the same predicament in the, in, in the future. We no, might say the youth yeah. should do this, do this, yeah. uh, no, but no. they will face the same predicament of their parents. Yes, no, I, I, I... I, I, I certainly don't I, don't, I don't think we should not be discussing the past and we should not be highlighting these issues because obviously his, it's the history that is, has brought us here and, and we need to understand, uh, you know, the true narrative of what happened. And I, I certainly concur with that. But, it, but in terms of my comments about what else we should be doing, I think, you know, we should also be focusing on how we can move on from a war that happened 40, 50 years ago and look to, look to see how we can improve the 
the, 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 the situation of the people on the ground, because I mean, I despair when I go to Zimbabwe to do some of the charity work that I do. And I wonder how we can actually improve the people's lives now on the ground, because that is what the people need, you know? Mm. Yeah, can I come in? Uh, can, can I come in? Yes, please. Um, I think um, what should be realized is that uh, apathy is not only political. Mm. If, you, if you listen to uh, Mr. Mdongo's question, people are not apathetic only politically, even economically. Mm. So there's a reason why people, there's so much apathy. Mm. And the reason is that our history is, has been distorted. Mm. And some of the things that we, try, we are trying to put in perspective is to get to a point where people will move together. Mm. We understand that we are supposed to be looking at the future mm. because we can't live in the past. Mm. That is a foregone th a, 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 a thing. Mm. But what we are trying to do is to correct history so that people will move together. Yeah, the distortions that are there are the ones that people that make people apathetic. What happened to the spirit that uh, Mr. Mdongo was asking about? Mm -hmm. What's more than that spirit? We should look at that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if, otherwise, even if we move into the digital stage, people mm -hmm. will still be apathetic. No, I understand. Yes. And we won't move. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, no, thanks very much. Um, I was wondering, uh, Joshua Matitanyon, uh, any comment, any question? You are on mute. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Is it on? We can hear you, but we can't see you. Oh, I don't know what happened to the photo. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the voice, the voice is more important. Uh, I, Thank you, uh, Babando, for very insightful, you know, discourse. Indeed, it's something that uh, uh, gives some meaning and a balance to the narrative that we've been hearing over the years. Uh, it's very important that at least that story be told, that uh, uh, aspect really be raised. And uh, what I like about it is like, you are really also bringing to the fore uh, the issues about people's contribution. And the problem is that every time somebody says, so-and-so contributed, or oh, I contributed more to the liberation struggle, you are demeaning rather than uh, uplifting the other, the other party. Why this is important is uh, also links up what uh, Liverson is saying about uh, uh, people feeling uh, discouraged in the current, uh, you know, discourse of doing development issues. This is why it's also very important for uh, Uba Umkanda to incorporate this uh, uh, understanding in that, uh, you know, even current development, they have got to be put on the bedrock of what has transpired in the past, in the sense that people need to know that their contribution is valued. And it's valued yesterday, uh, today, and it will be valued tomorrow. And so that uh, any messenger who comes with a development discourse in the midst of the community is got to be taken seriously. But also, they will ask you, okay, but do you understand where we are coming from? We are here because of ABC things that have happened in the past. Are you, wherever you are, coming in with a new language about us developing? appreciative of the things that we've gone through in the past. So that bedrock of trust needs to be really built on. And I think it's very important for us to appreciate. Yes, I appreciate the very fact that uh, uh, the young folks, uh, we need to be coming into the digital phase. It's something I, as a development consultant, also really are looking forward to. So I ask uh, young people to say, what is it that we have to introduce into communities for them to appreciate that we've moved on in terms of technology. But in terms of, uh, I mean, we'll do solar powered irrigation here and there and uh, introduce people to utilization of drones. But 
The fact is that uh, people's lives uh, matter today and as well as yesterday. So the messenger of any technological package also has got to be looked at and say, will he uh, take us on board or will he down uh, two miles down the line also ignore who we are and what we've come through in the past? Thank you. Kesi abonga kakulu e u tate we tu usandi siwe uma esese kona ngantwa nisambona sandi siwe ukona ngantwa nisambona o ukona no tate we tu sandi siwe any comment any questions I just have no questions. Okay, Nyabonga. Who that way to say, Fi? That way to say, Fi? Any comment? Any question? Uh, sorry, I'm trying to I mean, unmute myself. <laughs> okay. Mm. Hello, everyone. Yabo. Um, As far as this subject is concerned, uh, for me, uh, I'm old now, but I grew up, uh, I was slightly not younger, but my location did not um, allow me to experience the liberation struggle in its full manner. Although I was a victim somehow because the schools were closed in the rural areas and then uh, our father moved us into the city. So we kind of missed it that way, if you know what I mean. But um, no, I agree with the other speakers, both really both sides that say history is important to unravel and understand, but also we must move on. Um, especially talking about, you know, the, the, the narrative that has been misinterpreted over the years. Like I say, I was slightly younger, but if I look at those who are even younger, younger than me, they have no clue. At least I have some bits and pieces of it. But those who are younger than me have no clue whatsoever. For example, in some of my chats with Uwa uh, Wundlovu, you know, we chat now and again about the liberation struggle. You find Uwuti, you know, for example, this in the Vele Shona thing. There was a lot of Shonas in Zapo, quite a number of them. But how many people know that now with this narrative that was been given? Many people don't even know that. It's as if these people who've been fighting all our lives, but no, they all went out to fight the same enemy and they were actually fighting on the same side in the same teams. So something went wrong somewhere and the narrative has been disputed and somebody has taken advantage of that and forgot to tell us the story or deliberately left the truth such that now we look as if we are divided because Yet the division is not caused by that, to be fair. In the war, the, these people were fighting together alongside. He would tell you that, you know, he's, still, he's got friends in the Shona tribe. So have I, I've got Abazul and stuff like that. So that is not the issue. The issue is the misinterpretation, um, if you know what I mean. Thank you. Uh, while okay, these no, thank people you, thank you. are thinking of what to ask or what to say, uh, Babanjo. From yes, what people have said, do you have anything to say? Yes, I have something to say. Um, what I would like to let people know is that I'm someone who has moved on. If I, I look at myself and uh, what I went through um, in the all of my life up to where I am today, I'm somebody who has moved on a lot. Um, with no regrets, with no grudges, with, um, with all the freedom that I can attain. But um, I think it is necessary for the young generation to know the history of their country. And like us who grew up being taught about the British Empire, the Roman Empire, um, being you know, being taught colonial history, I think it is very, very necessary for us to know our history. Um, notwithstanding the fact that we are supposed to, to, to move on, but it is necessary if we are to be a people and remain a people. Because whatever stage we can reach, even technologically, 
without knowing who we are, who we are, we'll be like machines. It won't help us. And it is only through telling the truth of uh, history that we can trust each other. Because what I've realized is that there's one element of development, either politically or economically or religiously, that is left out all the time. And that is trust. As long as we don't tell the truth about our past in order for us to build a future, people will be apathetic. Because some there will be those who would be thinking, oh, maybe these people are coming here again to do what they did to us yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I think it is very, very necessary for history to be told, especially ours, that got to a point where it is told by uh, diverse institutions for, 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 for diverse reasons, instead, instead of telling the true history of the country as it is. If, if, if I'm making myself clear. Okay, yeah. No, see, I'm going to call you up on the job. trust the Angen, after you trust the Bulande, you can do it to San Jose. Hello? Again, I trust. Unmute yourself. Uh, okay, I have. Thank you very much. Uh, good, good, good evening to you all. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sandro, for the because of uh, some challenges here. Uh, but my my question is, um, how do we get these facts into the mainstream history? I mean, books have been written with that distorted history and. Uh, some of it is actually being learned at schools. So how do we uh, correct that? Thank you. Over to you, Wabanjo. How do we correct that? Um, <laughs> I think it boils down to the same thing that um, we need to start somewhere. We need to start somewhere. But um, that somewhere should be a place where we agree. Because at the moment, <laughs> as, 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 as a people, there are a lot of disagreements, some of which were deliberately created in order to create mistrust. But this it, is not an easy thing, uh, 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 Mr. Pomo, the, the, the question that you have asked. But I think the fact that we are compiling uh, these bits and pieces, one day they can be brought together uh, to constitute what we want to see. So uh, what I would say is that those who have the know-how, let's play our part. We will meet somewhere one day where this can be compiled into something comprehensive uh, to challenge the lies that, that have been told. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Penny Moyo. Hello. Oh, Mr. Yeah. Moyo, okay. You can, you can. Uh, I have no question, but I just want to make a comment. That's fine. I was, I want to corroborate what uh, Comrade Jove is just was presenting in his lecture because I was part of the ZAP youth structures. And we would like to confirm that indeed we acted as couriers of intelligence information, logistics and everything that it described is accurate and historical correct. I would also want to say that it is indeed true that the masses played an unsung role and very heroic. I would want to say at one stage, I actually carried a comrade who had been shot in a scotch cart, ferried him to a different district where he was further ferried and taken to Botswana for treatment. I had met the comrade after independence who would otherwise have died. Thank you. Uh, th th thanks very much, eh, Mr. Moyo. Uh, maybe if you don't mind, if you can sort of 
give us a picture of what risk do you think you faced at that time when you were carrying that information or helping in any way? Um, it was, well, that is that when I was in Form 1, my trunk from town was carrying, not my clothes, I was carrying boots, I was carrying jeans, I was carrying stockings for the liberation for the liberation fighters out in the villages when i was going home and fortunately the enemy never thought to search school kids at that time but i ran the risk i could have been if i had been arrested i would probably have been sent to to the kids mm -hmm. when we were carrying when i was carrying this comrade who had been shot i was also carrying maize for grinding and so when on my way back, I was stopped by the army. Fortunately, we cleaned the scotch cuts. I was now carrying millimeter. They searched everywhere, but could not find anything. And indeed, I ran the risk. I would have been shot. And I think my family would have suffered the same risk too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the, the risk clearly were too much or very high. Uh, because people were not armed, uh, but dodging those who were armed who could harm you anytime. Do you feel that the risk that you faced has been repaid, have been acknowledged and appreciated enough after independence? I don't think so. There's been no effort to acknowledge the contribution and I think the value, the our whole views of what the liberation struck would bring is very different from what we've experienced afterwards. Mm -hmm. The nightmare of post-independence, particularly between 1983 to 1987, the horrors that we lived through, I think were worse than what we experienced during the struggle for independence. Mm -hmm. uh can I come in? Uh, just a yes, yes, Mr. Yes. So, sorry, let Mr. Moore finish. Uh, do you finish, Mr. Moore? I, I feel a sense of betrayal. I, see, I feel a sense that there is, apart from the lack of acknowledgement, I feel deep down that we've been betrayed. That's all I can say. Okay, no, thank you. Mr. Sanjo. Okay, from what Mr. Moyo is saying, um, one can tell that it takes individuals with the resilience to carry on. Otherwise, some people who were involved during that time, it is very difficult for them to feel as part of the way forward for, that, for, for those reasons that they feel they were betrayed. One, if you listen to what Mr. Moyo has said, this tells you, and even the youth of today, the digital youth, that you cannot change a situation without sacrificing something. It might not be the same sacrifice that took place during our time, but the fact remains that you cannot change a situation while conforming to it. That's why you find that even in economics, whether it's in science, most people who are inventors, initially when they start, they are regarded as rebels because they go against convention. If yeah. I make myself clear. Okay, no, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Um, anyone with any comment or questions before we bring it to a close? If no one, then I will ask uh, Mr. Njov to give us his closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Very, yes. It seems as if there's someone who still, who still wants to say something. Yeah. Uh, was it trust? Oh, now he's, he's muted now. Okay. Um, 
Thank you very much. Um, once again, I would like to thank you, Matemelian Broadcasting Corporation for inviting me to give this uh, lecture um, about the participation of the masses, which uh, is always understated for reasons no, no, known to those who do it. Um, I also would like to thank the participants for their questions, for their comments and insights. And uh, last of all, um, I would like to say the purpose of this lecture was to enlighten those who might not have the information of exactly what transpired and not for the purpose of remaining ensconced in the past, but for the purpose of knowing the past in order to build a future. Thank you very much. Okay, eh siya bonga kakhulu eh mabandlovu. Sibonge kakhulu eh nangubo bonke aba participate leyo namhlanje eh ngembuzo nangembono yabe mihle kakhulu. Eh ngobani labo bantu aba contribute ayo who were those masses? Eqiniswe nikuthi abanye bekungobhudli bethu, abanye bekungobaba bethu, abanye bekungo anti bethu, omalume bethu, ogogo bethu. Eh Bunye nati ukobo ebe se skona na leso skati. Senze luguti umasisiya pambili sazu uti wongu mungu uwa kontupitayo abongwe ngogu fanele, abugwe ngogu fanele. Iko ge siya bonga kakuru asitanga nene futi kwa zinyinshe lo ze material broadcast in cooperation. Si bongi le kakuru. Disa. This is Matulene, Casting Corporation, inspired, inspired, inspired. inspired. inspired.